So, um, good morning. Welcome, Peter Van Aben, uh, Forrester and best-selling author, two lovely roles, I think, in life. Um, and obviously, chiefly famous for The Hidden Life of Trees, What They Feel and How They Communicate, uh, which is an international bestseller, translated into many languages. Um, and uh, we will get onto that later in the interview, but I just wanted to take you back, really, to your, to your childhood, and I think you were born in Bonn, which doesn't sound like, it sounds like a city life, but, um, you know, were you somebody who was climbing trees and running out to the forest and were always interested in trees, or how did your interest come around? I really don't know exactly, because um, in, in first years I um, lived in Bonn, in the former capital of Germany, uh, but uh, with the age of four, we moved into a little town 25 kilometers uh, south to Bonn, and there, uh, there were forest and uh, free landscape. And uh, but I was more interested in that time in building little cabins and making forbidden fi fires in the forest and things like that. And uh, to, in, uh, in that time, I was more interested in animals. I kept spiders and glasses, and I, I had a chicken read it on a, on a heating pillow of my grandma, so that the chicken after hatching. Uh, regarded me as, as its mother. <laughs> that, right. that made, made experience. And this chicken gets very old. Uh, it it, it uh, um, was later adopted by my English teacher and uh, was always sitting on his shoulder and marching through the, the little village um, because it thought it was human. <laughs> well, there you go. So it's, uh, that's a sort of Conrad Lorenz experiment, I think. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. right. I yeah. read that. Yeah. Um, so then, you know, so maybe it was animals that led you, or did you have some eureka moment where you suddenly thought, well, trees are amazing? And uh, no, I think um, after school, I, uh, as many young people, I thought, hmm, what should I study? And I uh, choose uh, choose then biology and. Uh, Afterwards, I read that in the newspaper that the German Forest Commission was searching for students for forestry. I said, okay, hmm, a forester is something like a tree keeper, so let's become a forester. But afterwards, it turned out that a forester is a little bit more like a tree butcher. And, uh, yeah, because the methods are, as you know, that there's not, not a big difference between uh, UK and uh, Germany. Uh, but it's done by big machines and it, that are plantations and it's not, nothing to the real wonders of a forest. And um, then I, I changed my view on, on forests and be, fell in love with trees. So that was very much out of your experience as a forester and the kind of industrial uh, approach to, to planting and, and harvesting trees and so on. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And I mean, you talk, uh, you know, about, uh, you know, one of the things you say in your book, uh, which comes out very strongly, is this kind of change of worldview, really, from seeing trees as competitors uh, to seeing trees as, as cooperating. Um, I just wonder how you came about, you know, that sort of thinking, where that came from and what your experience was, and also what the, the science was about behind that. Yeah. Uh, first to say, uh, foresters love uh, trees being competitors because then you're the referee with a chainsaw and say, okay, you have to go. And you're the one lucky one with more space to grow. Um, and foresters are more interested in, in the rapid grow of trees because then they are earlier uh, ready to harvest. Um, but in reality, uh, trees uh, work uh, very different. Um, and the, the changing moment for me was um, when I discovered this old stump in the forest, which is around about four to 500 years old and still alive without any green leaf. And such a stump uh, has also burns also sugar in its cells, like we all do. Um, and the question was, where did it get the energy from? And uh, the, the answer was from the surrounding trees, which uh, supported this old stump with um, root connections and um, uh, trans uh, transfer, um, uh, sending sugar through, through this, uh, root connections to this old stump. So uh, why should they do this uh, with a competitor, to a competitor? So. Um, Later, I found out that it's, it's just in this small bubble of forest science that forest scientists think, some, not all, uh, that trees are competitors, but most scientists uh, concerning biology, uh, genetic things, chemicals, and so on, think that this is a big ecosystem where many parts are working together. And we have 
very uh, strong um, signs on what forests, not just a single tree, are able to do when they work together, when they cooperate. For example, then they can cool down the landscape in uh, summertime in average about 10 degrees Celsius. It's not the, the, the rising temperatures, that's not climate change. We have climate change, of course, and the average temperature, that's climate change. In Germany, it's uh, so far 1.5 degrees, but the, the, the highest day temperature, that's not climate change. That is the change of land use and um, trees. They lo love the same summers that we do. Uh, they love it cool, they love it uh, with some rain and they, they don't like temperatures much above 25 degrees and they are able to create this local climate. That's the difference to, to, to us humans. Uh, they, but th therefore the forests have to be big enough. And that's exactly this, uh, the uh, thing about um, cooperation. As a single tree, you are not a forest. And when, when, if a tree would think, let's say, think, uh, oh, I would, the best would be uh, if I would be on my own, then this single tree couldn't uh, cool down the climate around about 10 degrees. A single tree can't create rain because the, it just needs a little wind to blow all away the coolness and then you, this tree spends a hot climate. So uh, we know, nowadays we know that for big forest ecosystems are responsible for the global rain. For example, um, Russian scientists found out that 80% of the rain in China came from the European Atlantic. And the, the trees and the forest are uh, bringing the rain up and down and up and down and, and much uh, move this, this rain uh, more and more eastwards to China, for example. So uh, we just are beginning to realize what, what forests are able to, and they are just able to do it all together, the trees. Well, that's a fascinating story I didn't know. The idea of a kind of relay race of the, you know, passing the yeah. baton of the, of the rain from one forest to another from the Atlantic to China. I mean, that's uh, amazing, isn't it? But it partly seems from this idea of, and as you said, there are some scientists too, I have this ecological look of, you know, of sort of moving away from the individual a little bit and looking yeah. at the collective and looking at uh, how things combine and what they can provide to each other and so on. And um, I mean, you know, there's a striking story in the Overstory, which is one of those books that, again, has, has, has encouraged people to look at trees differently about seeing a, a forest that was uh, maybe 100 acres, but really all one tree. And then the idea of communicating amongst the forest seems completely logical. If it's one thing, yeah. you think, well, why, why are people getting upset with you that you think you know, trees communicate? It seems very logical, uh, yeah, but where is, yeah. where is the, you know, I suppose it's the scientific basis when you say, oh, the, the old stump was sharing sugars and how did people, talk, talk a little bit more about how some of the science came out and how, I mean, obviously this has happened, you know, over your lifetime, particularly the, the, the growing understanding from the science. Um, yeah, but the, the, the understanding for this uh, sort of science is very old. For example, Alexander von Humboldt, uh, the, the well-known uh, German um, science traveler to Brazil, and uh, he already recognized that trees can create, uh, that forest ecosystem can create rain, wind systems, and so on, and cool the landscape. What I'm telling you now, that's recent research from uh, the Potsdam Institute for Climate Change, uh, and some universities in Germany uh, with satellite data, but Alexander von Humboldt uh, uh, knew that uh, by intuition, yeah, you know, by itself, he, he, he observed forests, and uh, that is one more than 150 years ago. Or let's say Charles Darwin already uh, said that the root tips of trees have brain neck structures like rainworms in their head. So that's Charles Darwin said so that's also some some decades ago. So that's nothing really new, new but uh, in between it was uh, up to date for scientists to say nature is a machine. It's just a machine. It's uh, in, uh, it's in modern days we, we would say it's uh, all individuals are driven by their genetical code like like a computer. In former days, it was it was machines. Nowadays, we say uh, that's like a computer, but that's nonsense. Uh, uh, we know, for example, that plants even recognize by viewing their neighbors, and they can recognize ah, that are my kins, that are my, is this my families, that are different plants with a, which have nothing to do with my family, and. Uh, 
that's nothing esoteric, that's nothing special. That's exact, uh, for example, that is uh, research done by uh, Swiss uh, researchers, which are very well known for not so much humor. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they are very correct. Uh, and they made wonderful, uh, wonderful things. Uh, how how plants work together, and uh, they they have it's really thrilling to read their their scientific reports. Although they are very dry written, let's say dry speech without emotions, and that's exactly what what I do. I, I say that's so wonderful what they are discovering, but no one likes to read it, and so I I uh, translate it in uh, everyday language. Uh, it's I do it with a, with, uh, with uh, much more emotions. I don't know why the scientific codex is to write everything without uh, emotions. That's that has nothing to do with facts or or, or fiction. Uh, it's just a way to express, and it, it's they they find an agreement to that that it's almost like written in Latin. So yeah. no one reads it, and, and yeah. that's so sad. And therefore, I help them a little bit to translate their discoveries. I have my own observations. And that all fits together, and we know it more and more that it's not okay to uh, have a look on nature uh, just on certain aspects of how we could use it, it on on uh, for our purpose. Yes, I mean that's obviously the, 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 one of the bigger problems that we are all kind of you know not not looking at so much is just our our approach, our attitudes, just to extract value all the time, to to see it as uh, right. something from which we can um, earn a living or make profit or whatever. And um, obviously, you worked within the industry for a while, and then we're we're just in front, you know, enchanted by it. Um, but I, I mean, I wonder in, in some ways what, what you seem to be saying almost is that there's, there's plenty of um, scientists and people who look at nature differently. It's just that we have this particular kind of industrial look that is dominating the way we strip out forests and, and remove rainforests. And we don't see um, how, how destructive that is because of our just our, our attitudes. I mean, yeah. do, you, do you, are you kind of optimistic that this kind of change of view is going on? People are talking a lot more about planting trees, protecting the forest and so on. Do you think the changes that, that we need to see are starting to happen? Yeah, I'm, I'm really optimistic. For example, look at the movement Fridays for Future. There are school kids which uh, who are driving the politicians to a, to a better uh, governance. So that's crazy. I wouldn't have imagined that 10 years ago that that would happen. And um, uh, what is also what also makes me optimistic is that the forest, the, the ecosystem always wants to come back. You just have to let it come back. Uh, for example, we have a tennis court here in the, the neighbor village. It's a little tennis court and no one wants to play tennis. <laughs> and it's fenced in and now for three or four years, no one has done anything in this court. Uh, and so the trees came, came back uh, in, we had uh, 2018, 19, 20, the uh, uh, three driest summers ever and the hottest summers ever. And on a tennis court, it's even worse. And uh, but but uh, the trees didn't care for that. We have now on this little tennis court, 10 different tree species. It's a little forest came back by itself. So in, on, under the worst conditions. So that means uh, the forest, they, they will come back as long as you let it come back. And you don't, you have to do nothing for that. Uh, it takes a little bit longer um, as if you would plant trees, but they will come back. For example, look at Chernobyl. It's a very sad example, but nowadays it's a wilderness. It's a wilderness. It's a it's a, a fully intact ecosystem, even with big mammals like uh, moose or wolves or uh, full of trees. So nature will come back. The problem is we just we are destroying our own ecological niche. Um, that that's our home, which we are destroying. We are not destroying nature. That we, we are not God. We are not able to make this whole planet uh, uh, crash. No, uh, nature will come back. The question is if it is too late for us. And um, when many people think, ah, uh, my needs are this and this and that, and yeah, what, what, what could we do? What could we spare for nature? Perhaps this little corner there. No, uh, it, it's concerning our life. Nature is able to wait. Nature is patient. Um, we will extinct some, some species. Yeah. <clears throat> that is very sad, but we, we can't uh, extinct nature. 
which, which some people think. Yeah, I, I think I, um, that's one of those great comforts, isn't it? I mean, you spend time thinking and, and being with people who are very, very worried and you, and, you know, and you go, OK, so, well, you know, so what's the worst situation? That human beings destroy their, their ability to survive and so on. But nature will carry on. It'll be in a different form. We will have done a huge amount of destruction, but, you know, some yeah. things will survive. And like you say, I mean, trees just want to live, don't they? And if you stop destroying them, they just come back and they they, they spread and, right. and so you just have to be a bit more patient but you, you leave it alone it'll come you know um but yeah, um, look, 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 yeah, yeah sorry no no go on, go yeah, look on. at look at look at uh, all those wonderful people and in, in great britain for example as we have here in germany you have uh, many ngos uh which care for forests or for trees and cities and the, the landscape for decades and they have uh, also made big efforts and and uh rewilding uh some areas it's not enough of course uh, because land uh is expensive i don't know it's, it's very very expensive in, the, in germany too because of the biomass uh increasing biomass use uh it's it's getting uh uh more more expensive but uh, there are so many people with a, which are connected, who are connected to trees, um, and who like to help uh, nature come back. And I think some we have, we have a bad politic energy politics in the moment, uh, which are destroying big forests. For example, uh, um, the big power plants like Drex, which are changing from coal to to uh, wood. Um, and we have in Germany, we have also the, this development that coal power plants should. Uh, change to wood biomass that is destroying a forest and that's not necessary because wood is or timber is the dirtiest uh, form of energy on earth it's worse than coal but the scientists agree except the forest scientists they say hey it's wonderful it's uh, carbon <laughs> neutral we should yeah. use more and more uh, we say no uh, and it's as you said we, we just look on one aspect on, on uh, the carbon, but even in, in, if you ju would just look on carbon, uh, it's not a good idea to burn uh, wood. But uh, if you look at the, this wonderful ecosystem, which creates rain, which cool down landscape, it's so important and it's not researched. Uh, some decades ago, um, biologists uh, talked about individuals, individual tree, individual humans and so on. Now we know, oh no, Every each individual is like an own planet, with your with your own bacteria system, for example. And uh, we know it from us, for example, that that our uh, gut bacteria are dictating what our brain is doing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Not in every case, not in every case, but we see I have a certain feeling. Ah, that's not a good thing. That uh, we know. Uh, meanwhile, that it comes from bacteria which are communicating with our brain, and some and sometimes also steering what we are doing our moods for example and it, on trees we have exactly the same they are th that's like a planet full of bacteria for example we know that uh, trees are also fighting viruses and there are new diseases from from the global trade uh, which uh, come to trees in, in europe and uh, the question is do we have a, a, a pandemic scenarios also for trees and the answer is yes but who the hell cares for viruses in trees? So we, we haven't understand, uh, I say around about 90, 95% what, what's happening all around trees. We know that they grow, that they have a lot of timber, that they have leaves, they fall down and, and fall and so on. But we don't know what they are interacting with and what this, this ecosystem really means. So the best thing we could do for nature is not to calculate our oh, how much is a tree worth in, uh, in, in uh, times of climate change and what would it cost to re replace it with a technical machine and what uh, is the benefit and so on. No, that are wonders, that are wonders which are so important for us, for our emotional balance, for example. And there, I'm not a tree hugger, but I, I recommend everyone to hug trees because everyone uh, who hug trees is not carrying a chainsaw in a, in a sense. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you know, for, in, in my life, I think um, being in a redwood grove, you know, there is nothing quite like it. You know, you go there and there is a sense, you know, of awe 
of these huge trees that are there. And um, I think, you know, that sort of reconnection with that sense of wonder about nature does seem to me, um, you know, it's great to have and it's great to pass on to your children and others and so on. But um, there seems to be something there that's quite a different kind of approach. But I, I quite like to come back to your language because you were talking about science and, and then talking about um, you know, feelings, you know, that's what, you know, the, the subtitle of your book is what they feel and how they communicate. And, th and that sense of, of people trying to keep their feelings on one side. So then they can cut down a thousand trees a day and do it or whatever, you know, and, and you get a lot of criticism for this um, popularizing and using this kind of language. I mean, just talk, you want to talk a, bit, a little bit about that and why you think that's important, how it works for people to sort of yeah. see things in that way. Uh, we think that we we humans have uh, invented uh, emotions, feelings, but we are the latest invention of nature, and we are uh, sitting on a base of inventions uh, uh, which are more than five hundred million years old. And for example, you we even find hormones in plants. You find also the the love hormone uh, oxytocin in goldfish. <laughs> uh, or in insects, we say, okay, what it's doing there? Ah, perhaps the same uh, which is doing us. So that are old mechanisms which are uh, which are invented long, long ago uh, before the first human uh, put this foot on this little planet. Um, but uh, to, to say it in other words, we know that trees are communicating and a tree which is not able to move must recognize what's going on. Uh, with, uh, if a danger is approaching, uh, if uh, if, it, if a drought is approaching, if something is happening because uh, he, because it is not able to move, it has to prepare uh, and because it's so slow, it has to recognize it as early as possible. And that is, for example, the communication by smell. Now scientists can say, oh, okay, smelling is not talking. Okay, but it's a different thing. But Emailing is also not talking, but <laughs> it's a very new form of communication. So that's also okay. And we know even that uh, the plants can even feel pain and they really can feel pain. That's uh, uh, research from the University of Bonn, which is not known for uh, esoteric research. It's a little bit like the Swiss institutions. <laughs> and um, uh, you can measure when a bark beetle, for example, is biting in the bark. Then you can measure an electrical signal in the tissue of the tree. You can measure a defending reaction, but that is not, not um, necessarily uh, to mean that that is pain. But in some situations, plants like us are producing pain suppressing substances. And uh, why do we do that? We, we need it in stressy situations when you have an accident, for example, your legs are broken uh, and then your body uh, is reacting uh, and producing pain suppressing substances in some cases because your body don't want that you lose your consciousness. And uh, plants do it exactly the same way. And you can prove that if you're, um, if you're, I don't know the right word, necroticize. When if you, if you use narcotics to okay. to uh, for a surgery, for example, you could can use the same um, chemicals for plants, and they then they also stop producing pain suppressing substances, like okay. us when we are have a surgery and we have this uh, this medicine. Uh, our, we are not conscious anymore, and then our body stops to suppress uh, to suppress pain because it's away, and. In that situation, plants do, do the same. So we have strong hints that plants are perhaps conscious and we and they have the same reactions on pain. So the conclusion is it's very likely that they can feel pain. And many people don't like that because they say, okay, I shouldn't eat meat, but perhaps now I'm a vegetarian and now I know that plants can also feel pain what else should I eat? No, but that's not the question which uh, scientists would, would ask. They just say that that is the world as it is. And the answer uh, to help you out of that could be, be more respectful uh, in what you do with the environment. And that's, I think, one of the easiest advice. We all know that by heart, uh, that we have to be more respectful and then what we use, we can use it with, with joy, with, with fun, uh, and it's okay. It's okay to use timber. It's okay to eat meat. I'm a, I'm a vegetarian, but 
I think it's okay to eat meat as long as uh, the trees and the animals had a happy life. And that's and then we all knew to to let them uh, live a happy life. We have to reduce our consumption. Well, that's uh, yeah, I certainly agree with you on that, isn't it? I mean, this sense of this respect and not doing things carelessly or unnecessarily, yeah. and then you know thinking about the impact of what you're consuming and what you're using and maybe um, consuming and using less, isn't it really? Yeah. Um, and that seems, uh, you know, and in some sense, um, I, you know, your combination, you've got these two lovely job titles of forester and author, but using the, the words to kind of get people to understand that and have a little bit more um, respect for what you're, you, you know, what is around them, I guess. And uh, you use this term, you know, the wood wide web. I mean, that, that catches people's imagination. I mean, how far do you think that goes? I mean, do you think trees really can communicate from, say, the tip of South America to, you know, New England? I mean, or you, you're talking about it in in a, in a kind of like within a forest, as it were. Uh, perhaps first, uh, I have to say that this um, this term was created by the magazine Nature yeah. in the nine, 1990s. So uh, that's nothing really new. And and, and even when I started my uh, forest studies, I we we get known to this underground network. Uh, so that's that's long known. How far it reaches, we don't know. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a forest, it, I think that may reach um, about some kilometers in a forest. Uh, but there are other ways of communication. For example, um, beech or oaks, they arrange for blooming because they don't want to have just here and there some seed. They want to have it all together in one year and then in, in the next one or two or three years, no seeds, because uh, in this way, they get white boar or deer out of the way. Uh, in one year, they have too much for them to feed. And then the next year, it's, it's uh, just a few seeds so that the whole population of animals break down and uh, trees don't love to, uh, that their seeds are, are uh, fed by, by animals. So, uh, therefore, they have to arrange to, to bloom and they do it for, I, I know it just for Germany, they do it all over Germany in the same year. And then you have some years without blooming trees and that has nothing to do with the, with the weather, the local weather, because trees have to plan uh, this blooming two years in advance. So this has, has nothing to do, some people think, ah, the last year was so dry, so they are producing seeds because they think they are dying and to reproduce again. No, that's nonsense because they, they do it two years in advance. And uh, we, till nowadays, we don't know how they arrange uh, uh, about such big distances. We don't know, uh, that's all I can say. And that's, I think, uh, when, you, when you talk with good scientists, the every th second answer is, I don't know it. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is yeah al always good isn't it to hear people who are less certain of um, their knowledge yeah, yeah. Say. but uh, yeah I think you know for those of us who like have apple trees or something we expect there would be a good year and then a not so good year so there's yeah, this idea yeah. that, that maybe it just you know but I hadn't really heard it explained in that in that way in terms of preparing two years ahead of time to have your big um, bloom is that how, how does that happen I mean you know how is it that, that all across Germany the trees decide this year or two years time it's going to happen yeah it's uh, we really don't know it i think it's it's it doesn't depend on weather uh, that's the only thing we we can say because it happens whether uh, if it is dry or or wet um, it, it, it doesn't uh, make a difference so it's really a, a mystery mm -hmm. um how such a, a communication if it is a communication we don't know it because perhaps it's an a, a rhythm it's not a regular rhythm because sometimes it's just one year next time it's, it's a four year gap but for example we have uh, one, uh, we have 1000 year old oaks in eastern germany which seems to remember their spanish origin where because this population came from spain after the ice age and this uh, 1000 year old oaks are not so far away from from this time okay it's they are 10000 years away from this time but uh, in, in, in tree uh, in, uh, if, if tree could measure time that's nothing and now after 1000 years they are changing the shape of their leaves and it seems to be that is that it is a different species which is be better adapted to hot hot uh, condition 
this one 1000 year old oak is changing it to the shape of the leaves and uh, usually this shape of the leaves is the shape of a different uh, oak species and now scientists say okay perhaps we don't have different oak species but perhaps th this are just uh, it's the same species with different experience and we thought that we were three different species so we see this oak is something like remembering 1000 year back so um, it, it's recent research from from uh, 2020 uh, and forest scientists that's even <laughs> even harder uh, to accept uh, for for them uh, uh, that that a tree is able to remember to learn and uh, then to change its uh, behavior after such a long time so to come back to your question we don't know so many things about trees, and uh, I think it's one of the easiest questions, how they arrange to bloom. <laughs> <laughs> That's the easy question. Okay, but this idea that a tree has started then to adapt to, to climate change then, really, in, in a sense of saying, okay, this tree is a thousand years old, but it's changing the shape of its leaves, it's got a memory, but it's adapting to a change. I mean, that that is quite fascinating and in in sense um very uh, optimistic isn't it in the sense that the, the trees are yeah. the chance yeah. if it doesn't happen too quickly etc cetera, etc cetera, that, that they have mechanisms to it's just not just about moving north shall we say no no no, no. Uh, we, we know that they can learn for example uh, some scientists brought um, spruce trees from austria to norway where it's much colder and the next generation of this trees coming to norway um this generation was better adapted to cold. So that means that the, Nor uh, the, the Austrian spruce learned how to, uh, to deal with colder climate. They were not able to, de uh, to deal correctly with the colder the climate, but their offspring were. So uh, they taught them by that, that are epigenetic processes, uh, as far as we know, uh, to deal with, with uh, the cooler uh, climate and vice versa. They um, brought Norwegian spruce to warmer climate and the offspring from those Norwegian spruce lost the ability to deal with cold climate. So uh, trees are, are able to learn within one generation. They, they it takes sometimes, they are so also uh, able to learn from one year to another. For example, um, the trees which uh, have experienced uh, the heavy droughts in the last year, they reduce their water consumption for the rest of their lives. So they don't need that much water. They are learning and people, uh, who are seeing that the trees are leaving their, uh, um, uh, letting down their leaves falling uh, in August, for example, they think, oh, the tree is dying, the tree is weak, uh, perhaps we should fell it. German forces always say, oh, okay, we have to fell it, it's over. And we say, no, it's a learning tree. <laughs> yeah. let, let, let the tree uh, uh, learn its lecture, but don't, don't cut it off. Uh, Peter, this is absolutely fascinating. I could sit here for hours talking to you and, um, you know, I should uh, obviously go off and read your book uh, and learn more about trees and research it because, um, uh, well, I just think there's nothing like planting the trees in the day and you feel better for doing that, but learning and understanding more is also great. It's been really, really interesting to, to listen to you and to have this conversation. So thank you so much for dropping into the festival. Um, you know, we're really looking forward to doing the UK premiere of the film and uh, tickets are already flying off the shelf so i'm sure it's going to be sold out so thank you so much for your contribution and your books and and, and everything you're doing thank you thank you very much david and i wish you all the best for the festival and i hope uh, you know, it will be very successful even in this hard times but i think uh we will make the best out of it and uh, wish you good luck and thank you very much thank you bye-bye bye-bye <laughs>